Hello and welcome to the 741 channel. Thank you for stopping by. Today we're going to take a look at this Pacific Antennas 20 and 40 meter trap dipole antenna kit that I picked up from Pacific Antenna. So those of you who are regular subscribers to my channel will know that I've done a few POTA activations over the last year or so and up until now I've pretty much made my own antennas out of uh, Home Depot 14 gauge stranded wire and that works just fine. Um, but I wanted something a little bit more portable, a little lighter, a little more compact for when I go out on the motorcycle. Uh, the antenna that I have now works, but it takes up a lot of space in my pack. So I thought something like this might be a little easier to use. Also, it'll take up a little bit less footprint than my 40 and 20 meter uh, full-sized link dipole. The other thing I like about this is that it was cheap. This was only 25 bucks. So let's get this out of the package over on the bench and see what we have to do to build it. So I've come over to the QRP kits website and I've gotten the manual for the antenna. You can see here's page one. This just shows a picture of everything in its sort of final configuration. And then some information about the overall lengths that we're going to be dealing with here. Brief description of the antenna, recommended tools that we're going to need to put this thing together. And then we'll start here at the before you start page. So as the manual suggests, the first thing that I will do is inventory the kit and make sure I have all of these pieces. I think I've got everything that I'm supposed to have according to the manual. Got the heat shrink tubing, I got these two long skinny circuit boards, a couple of tubes here, a couple of rings here, one, two, three, four capacitors, another circuit board, BNC connector, and of course the wire here. And being a bit of a circuit board geek, I want to take a closer look at these. These look like they're about 62,000 thick or so. Got a, kind of a nice teal uh, solder mask color on there. It may look a little washed out in the camera because of my blue background here, but it's not the traditional dark green of a regular circuit board. The surface finish here looks like it's hot air solder level, and we do have some plated through holes, some areas of copper fill in there, so looks pretty good. And then taking a look at the spreader boards, they're about the same. You can see plated through holes, some fat traces, and some nice silk screening on this so you know where to put the capacitors. Okay, and here's a look at the wire. Now it's almost the same color as my desk mat, so it's a little hard to see in the camera, but it seems like it's pretty decent quality wire. Nice and flexible, thin and light. I believe this is 24 gauge stranded wire. So the next step is to measure out and cut some sections of wire. So I'm gonna go over on the other side of the cellar, stretch out my tape measure, and take care of that now. Okay, so the next step in the process is to install the capacitors on the two long skinny boards. There's two in each. What I'm going to do is just drop these in. It doesn't matter which way they go. These are not polarized. Now instead of bending the leads like I normally would, I'm actually going to bend the capacitor over like it shows in the manual to kind of hold it in place. And now I should be able to just flip this over and we can solder the leads on. Now it's time to wind up the coils. You can see I've got one of the coil forms and I've got one of the wires here that I cut to 10 foot 4 inches and I've got it threaded through the hole in one end of the form and I've got about 2 inches kind of left over here and of course that's what the instructions recommended. So now I'm going to start the winding process. You can see here if I go around like that, that is one turn. The turn starts there kind of where the wire goes into the hole and then it wraps around and makes one complete circumference of the circle and we're just going to keep going and count up 51 turns. Now in the manual they suggest that you kind of mark every 10 turns or so so you don't lose count. So I got a marker here ready to do that. So let's wind this thing up. Okay, that should be 51, so I'm going to put this through the hole here. Okay, so there's the finished product. I'm just going to double check and count, make sure I've got the right number of turns, and then I'm going to set this aside and do the, the other one. So as you can see, I've got both coils all wound up on the forms, and I've actually got the wires trimmed to length. The instructions call for about an inch. 
and then strip the ends a little bit so that they can be soldered into the board. Okay, so next up we're just going to slide the long circuit boards into the tubes. Just watch the capacitors so they don't hit the wires on the inside there and pull them out, kind of get things centered. And then what I'm going to do is route these wires through the plated through holes that are in the end of the circuit board there. Now, these are tied together on the back side of the board, so it really doesn't matter which hole you put it in. Okay, so for the next step, we're going to take the 8-foot wire and we're going to solder that on one end of the coil and then we're going to take the 17-footer and install that on the other end and then of course we'll repeat the process on the other coil. Now it doesn't matter which end you put which wire on at this point. I've got more room on this side of my bench so I'm going to put the 17-footer over here and the 8-footer on this side. So before I strip the wire I'm actually going to run it through the strain relief holes first just so that I don't end up unfraying the ends after I strip it. So I'll pull it up like that. I'll make sure I have enough slack to get back down into the wire. And you can see that I should, so I'll strip that out and solder it in and then do the same thing for the 17 footer. Okay, so now that I have those wires soldered, what I'm gonna do is remove the excess slack in the loop by just kind of pushing it through the strain relief hole and then pulling the free end kind of tight. And I think we're good to go there. So now all I have to do is clean this up just a little bit more to get the remaining flux residue off, and I think I'll move on to the next one. Okay, so the next step is to take the BNC connector here and mount that to the center printed circuit board. So I'm going to pull the nut off of the connector here. I'm going to set the nut aside, leave the rest of the hardware on the connector, and drop that onto the board. And I'm just going to hand tighten this for now, just in case I need to loosen it up or something, but once I'm done soldering, I think what I'll do is put a wrench on there and give it a, a snug. Probably wouldn't even hurt to put a little Loctite on here when you're done, just so that it doesn't loosen up when you're out in the field. Okay, so the next step is going to be to trim the 17-foot section of wire to 16 feet 9 inches. This is actually going to become the inner part of the dipole, so to speak, and be soldered to the center insulator next. So I'm going to trim both of the sections now and then we'll get ready to solder. So you can see I've got the dipole leg soldered on. Now the last thing I need to do is solder a wire from the center pin of the BNC connector over to this extra hole in the board. I'm going to use one of the scrap pieces of wire. I'm going to cut this to about two inches I think should be good. And we'll get that soldered in, and I think we'll be ready for some testing. So there's one last thing to do here on the bench before we head outside for tuning and testing, and that's to put these little PVC rings on the free ends of the wires. These are the end insulators. So I'm just going to bring these and tie them off sort of in a double knot for now. Uh, we may need to uh, trim these a little bit depending on how the antenna is or maybe we'll even need to add a little length, I'm not sure, but I'll just tie them off temporarily for now. Once I've got everything tuned, I can secure these more permanently. Now one thing to note on, on these little PVC collars, I, it's just a cut piece of PVC tubing but <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. It's just a quick and easy end insulator. Should be plenty strong for a temporary antenna like this. I think I'm going to steal this design and use it maybe on some of my future antennas. Anyway, I think we're ready to go outside and do some tuning and testing. As you can see, I've got the antenna mounted to one of my military poles. You can see I've got a short piece of paracord here to hold it up. I'm just using the hole that's in the center insulator here. And you also may be able to see that I've got a BNC to SO239 adapter on there so that I can run my standard uh, length of coax on it. Anyway, let's get this unraveled and set up in the yard so we can test it. So here's a look at the antenna in its installed condition. You can see I've got the center insulator up there on top of the pole with the coax coming down and the two legs going off to either side and I don't know what angle that's, maybe about 75 or 70 degrees or something, not quite horizontal. 
and then off to my side support poles over there. Not sure if I can see them in the camera or not, but they are over there with some orange paracord tying them off to the sides. Now we got everything hooked up to the analyzer here, and you can see right about at the middle of the 40 meter band, things are looking pretty good. So I don't think we need to do anything there. If I slide up and down the band a little bit, you can see that as we go down the band, the SWR goes up relatively sharply, which is what you would expect. This is kind of thin diameter wire, uh, but everything looks like it's pretty usable. A little bit of inductance here as we get away from the center frequency. But overall, I think we're going to be pretty good here right on 40 meters. So now if we slide over to 20, you can see if I tune around here, the antenna is probably a little bit long for 20. You can see things bottom out right around 13.5 megahertz or so. They're looking pretty good there. And then as we slide up into the 20 meter band, things start to look uh, not horrible, but not as good as they could be. Okay, so I think I finally got the antenna tuned right where I want it. Here on 20 meters, I ended up having to take, oh, almost a foot of wire off of each side of the leg. I had to cut it and re-solder it, and I did that in sort of like two inch increments. So it took a little while to kind of get things dialed in. Now, of course, because I took so much wire off of the 20 meter legs, I had to kind of add it back on to the 40 meter to lengthen that out. And I've got that almost where I want it. I think I need to add a couple of more inches there and it'll be perfect. But I think for right now, it's close enough to do some testing. So you can see in the analyzer here on 20 meters, Right around the center of the band or so, SWR is good. Resistance is close to 50, and there's a little bit of reactance there depending on kind of where we tune things, but it should be pretty usable across the phone portion of 20 meters anyway. Okay, so if I switch over to 40, you can see things are looking pretty good here. It's more or less centered in the band, but when I get up near the edges, you can see that the SWR kind of starts to go up and the resistance drops a bit here. So when I'm running 40, I'm probably going to want to stay closer to the center of the band with this antenna, but that's okay. So unfortunately, my microphone battery went dead, and I hadn't realized it during the shooting of the next couple of clips. So I'll just kind of voice over what's going on here. At this point, the antenna has been tuned, and the last bit of construction that I need to do is to slip the shrink tubing over the free end of the wire and get it kind of centered over the coil. Now that I have the heat shrink tubing positioned over the coils, I'll just use a heat gun to shrink it. Okay, so I'm going to start off on 20 meters here. I'll tune around the band, I'll let you guys listen to what I'm hearing, and then maybe I'll try and make a contact or two here. We'll see what happens. Okay, Sugar, Delta Sierra. I think that's correct. Victor Oscar 1, Sugar Delta Sierra, is that a Kessel? Okay, Kessel the 5 knot plus 20. Okay, so we got a few European stations in there coming in pretty strong right now. Um, I tried to go back to one that was calling CQ. I didn't make it through the pileup. Uh, but what I want to do is switch over to 40, listen over there a bit just so you guys can hear it. And then I've got to wrap up. I've actually got a meeting here in a few minutes that I got to get to, but maybe we'll fire this up and try and make some contacts tomorrow. Okay, like I said, we're over on 40. Let's tune around and see what we can hear. and 20 meters are both really working well right now. I'm hearing European stations and hearing them strong. So uh, I wish I had more time to sit out here and try and make a few contacts or call CQ for a bit. But like I said, I do got to get in for a meeting. So 
Um, hopefully here at some point in the future I can actually try and make some actual contacts on this antenna, but I have no doubt now that I have it tuned up that it's going to work just fine, uh, especially for POTA activations and things like that, maybe field day. Okay, so that's going to wrap things up for the Pacific Antenna's 20 and 40 meter trap dipole. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to leave a comment or subscribe, feel free to do that as well. If you'd like to support my channel in another way, please consider visiting my Amazon store, which you'll find linked in the description below. Thanks for watching.